日本史学習に最高にもってこいのサイトサムライアーカイブスポッドキャストへようこそ美しい自然にあふれてる縄文時代から波乱万丈な幕末まで全時代を網羅して日本史の隅から隅まで一緒に語り合いましょうでは早速日本史の世界へはい。So, I have to ask, what,、uh, what did Ryukyu get out of all of these missions during the Sengoku period? Because、yeah. it can't just be a matter of we're going to be nice and try to have nice relations with our neighbors. It, they, they must have thought they were getting something out of it because it seems to me like the end result was they were just setting this precedent that built it up over year, over year, over year to where the Japanese decided that they've proven that they're subordinate to us, but they're not quite following the orders that we want. So, we're going to have to go get them. Yeah,、um, I think. My impression is that these really were, for lack of a better word, normal relations, that, that they were just being cordial, that they were being social, that they were doing the correct thing that, that、uh, any court or house would do in relations with one another. Um, um, I, um, I know I have an acquaintance, I guess I'll say, an acquaintance, a colleague who recently finished his PhD at the University of the Ryukyus. And he's currently working on research on the relationship between the Shimazu and the Konoe, the Konoe、uh, family of court nobles. And, you know, the Shimazu and the Konoe also traveled to each other's cities, exchanged poetry, probably exchanged gifts, you know, but neither of them thought that the other was subordinate. So, you know, what exactly they were getting out of it,、uh, I, I couldn't say precisely.、Uh, trade relations, obviously. None of these domains, none of these kingdoms are truly isolated. They had trade going on, so they must have. I can only assume these missions had something to do with、uh, maybe not negotiating exact trade terms like we do in diplomacy today, but it was somehow interconnected with maintaining friendly relations in that respect.、Um, certainly, there was, a lot of,、uh, there was a lot of cultural exchange. Zen Buddhism was introduced to Ryukyu via Kagoshima. And.、Um, And actually, a lot of、um, Confucian classics and other kinds of things like that were introduced to Kagoshima via Ryukyu. So there was a lot of that kind of thing going on. And, Ryukyu, and as I said, Ryukyu was also sending missions to,、uh, to Muromachi and also to the, the Ouchi and the Hosokawa and some other families, which I believe was also in some kind of connection with trade, trade relations. Okay. Well, I mean, it makes sense that they, they would be making these trips for. Political reasons, but it seems that the Japanese, I don't, or, or would you say the Japanese just read way more into it than they should have? Or maybe that was a, a strategic way of kind of justifying an invasion of Ryukyu?、Um, I think that、um, it's a hard question. I, I think that the Shimazu were reading into it, but they chose to read into it.、Mm, that does make sense. But I, I, don't, I don't know. It's hard to say because I think that Kuroshima Satoru argues that it was just, well, I think the way he represents it is that it was just a, a, a difference of understanding, that both sides didn't understand, that the other side thought differently about it. But、um, I'm, I'm not 100% sure how deep the documentary record is.、Um, and I suppose it must be actually for the Shimazu that probably is plenty of documents that I just haven't read. Um, and if you really read through them, as Kuroshima probably has, then you know, maybe you get a good sense of uh, uh, you know, what people thought at the time or what they were trying to accomplish. Or... I guess getting back to the actual procession part of things, because I, I realized I hadn't asked this earlier on,、uh, what was a typical round trip? It sounds like these were really long. Like if you were going to go on this procession from Okinawa, you were going to be gone for a year. Is that what it is?、Or? Yes. Yes, about a year. So,、um, embassies usually left,、uh, left Okinawa in the sixth or seventh month on the lunar calendar, which I guess corresponds to sort of late summer, I think.
because that was um, that was the time when the winds were best, right? It's it's easy to forget that. Um, and I don't, I'm, I'm not a nautical person. I don't know about this stuff, but you know, I was sort of reminded over the course of my readings on this. We have to remember that you know, winds and weather is is just so crucial. So, th- so they would leave Okinawa in the sixth or seventh month in order to go to Kagoshima at a time when the winds were advantageous for that. Um, they would stay in Kagoshima for a certain amount of time. Um, I think previously, like, yeah, I think earlier in this podcast, I said like three to six months, but I don't think that's maybe up to maybe up to three months, something like that. And then, yeah, probably right up uh, something like that. And then it would take them however long, a few months to maybe only one month. Maybe I'm misremembering. Well, anyway, it would take them a little while to get to Edo. Um, and then once they were in Edo, if I remember correctly, so they, they usually arrived in Edo in like the 11th month or so. So it's getting to be winter. Um, and they would stay in Edo for about one month, I believe. Yeah, for about one month. They would meet with the shogun two or three times, and they would also have uh, just a, a score of different sort of formal obligations, formal activities at the Shimazu mansions and, uh, and elsewhere. And then they would leave Edo. I think actually, I think they almost always left Edo before New Year's. So they leave Edo in the late 12th month. So now we're really in winter and make their way home, usually arriving back in, in Ryukyu, I think maybe around the fourth month. So it's been 10 months. Hmm. Okay, so it sounds like they probably spend time in Kagoshima on the way there and on the way back. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. Okay, and then actually another thing that I was kind of thinking of, and I, I know it's not a direct comparison, but kind of going back to the idea of these processions being similar in concept to Sunking Kotai, um, the main, uh, well, for the listeners, I'm sure they know, but for the main purpose of Sunking Kotai was to kind of uh, rein in the finances of the daimyo to kind of make them burn through their money so they can't just stockpile cash, essentially. So I was actually wondering if, uh, and this may be an odd way to put it, but were these trips by, by the Ryukyuans cheaper than a typical Sunkin Kotai? Were they not required such displays of wealth and pomp and circumstance maybe as a typical daimyo because the purpose wasn't to bankrupt the Okinawans? I don't know. What do you think about that? Yeah, that's a good question. I never actually thought about it that way. So that's actually a really good question. Um, so there's a few different things there. So, well, first of all, I, I, I would say that part of, part of the purpose of Sankin Kotai, absolutely this economic side of it, absolutely, not only by requiring the daimyo to pay so much money to do this all the time, but also by requiring the daimyo to be, to be either on the road or in Edo and away from their domain half the time, it really disrupts the ability of the daimyo to stockpile um, power, to plan a coup, to do any of these kinds of things. So that, I think that's that's big. I personally would also want to emphasize the the daimyo's actual meetings with the shogun. When a daimyo arrives in Edo, you know, in, in accordance with Sankin Kotai, he, and then also on numerous occasions during his time in Edo, a daimyo will meet with the shogun Bow, kowtow to him, present him with gifts. Um, I'm not sure if the daimyo ever really all that regularly presented them with um, like letters, official letters stating their loyalty. Maybe they did, I forget. But presenting them with gifts, including horses and swords, uh, which are very symbolic of like, I'm, 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 I'm lending you my, well, the sword and as well as the horse is really kind of, you know, I'm lending you my, my martial capability, right? I'm giving up uh, military tools to you, my lord. And these swords, uh, this is a whole other complicated conversation, but a lot of times these swords were actually purely symbolic. They were like sticks of wood that were lacquered to look nice. But a lot of times they were, they were like Kamakura or Muromachi era swords that were like serious heirlooms of the family. And you're giving them up to the shogun who then very well might give you another uh, heirloom sword in return. But I think that I personally would, would really like to say that not only having to be in Edo, not only having to spend that money, but having to be in the castle, bowing to the shogun before so many other lords who see you bow to the shogun, 
having to give him such extensive gifts, even though you're actually getting more gifts in return. All of this kind of ritual stuff is actually really powerful towards kind of forcing the daimyo to at least pretend to be, to at least act out the actions of being a loyal vassal. So I wanted to say all of that. But in terms of the expense and the pomp and circumstance, the, the Ryukyuan processions were extremely flashy. They were extremely, they involved extremely expensive ob objects, materials. Much of the gifts that the Ryukyuans gave to the shogunate um, came from China. They were, uh, much of them were actually, well, much of them were either gifts from the Chinese emperor, actually, or they were purchased um, at market in, in Fuzhou or in Beijing. Um, but they were, you know, really rare, Lux uh, real, r rare Chinese goods that you couldn't get almost anywhere else. Or they were really, really high quality textiles from Kumejima, Miyako, other parts of Ryukyu. Sometimes they gave them horses from Yonaguni or, or Taketomi. Sometimes they gave them horses from Satsuma. Um, so the, the, the gifts that the Ryukyuans are giving to the shogun are extremely expensive. And then also the things that they're, the, the, the clothes they're wearing, the sedan chairs they're riding in, the lacquered and gilded uh, uh, halberds that they're carrying, all of these things are um, extremely lavish and expensive. And so there, there definitely is an element of, of pomp and circumstance involved for sure. But that said, there's only about 100 Ryukyuans traveling to Edo at any given time. The smallest mission was somewhere around 70 people, and the largest mission was right around 170 people. So um, I don't know the precise costs at all in terms of, you know, number of con of silver, but bringing 100 or 170 Ryukyuans to Edo as compared to bringing 3,000 samurai, samurai from Satsuma to Edo, it's a different... Uh, uh, it's a different cost. And also, the Ryukyuans would stay in Edo for about one month, whereas the, she, whereas the daimyo had to maintain a mansion perpetually, and that mansion would be, be uh, that mansion would house thousands of samurai and servants and so on and so forth. And so the, there's, uh, you know, extreme expense there as well. So there's a very different level of expense. But whatever the level of expense was, and I, I don't know the numbers, it was very expensive for the kingdom, and the kingdom very often borrowed money from Satsuma to pay for it, and Satsuma very often borrowed money from the Bakafu to pay for it. So, basically, the in a way, the Bakafu was kind of paying them to come just so that they can go there to show that they are paying fealty to the Bakafu, in a sense. Interesting. Yes. Yes, and and the and the the. the yeah, the shogunate paid much more directly in the case of the of the Korean missions. Yeah, in the Ryukyuan missions, the shogunate is lending money to Satsuma to help pay for it because it's really Satsuma's thing that they should be doing. In the case of the Korean missions, the shogunate is pretty much paying outright um, for a lot of it, just in order to welcome these Korean ambassadors as as guests of the Tokugawa, not as vassals of anybody else you know, but directly as guests of the Tokugawa. So since we're on the subject of uh, the Shimazu and the Ryukyuans, their relations, how did the Shimazu actually rule on the ground in, in Ryukyu? Were there troops on the ground or were there just representatives of the Shimazu or was it even delegated to the point where they weren't really on the ground at all and it was just given to the Okinawans to sort of delegate them to rule themselves? How, how did that work? Yeah, good, good question. So... Satsuma appointed um, uh, Satsuma maintained a, a small office in in Naha. So it's actually I don't know what it might have been at that time on dirt roads or I, I don't know what the differences are. But anyway, they maintained an office in Naha, um, which at that time was a separate city from the royal capital of Shudi. So it was um, I, I've walked it and it, it only took a few hours. But anyway, a few hours walk away from the royal palace, a good distance. And they maintained the small office led by a guy named the Zaiban Bugyo, so a magistrate who is in residence, a resident magistrate. And the Zaiban Bugyo headed this office of 10 or 15 people, and they were the only Japanese in the islands. There, were no, there was no extensive troops. There was no uh, anything like that. Um, and the Zaiban Bugyo was there 
to, um, you know, he, he met with members of, of the court, probably met with the king directly on occasion, and, you know, con- conveyed Satsuma, conveyed Kagoshima's desires, their orders, negotiated various things, these kinds of things. Um, in certain respects, I suppose he played some role in overseeing that certain things were being observed correctly, you know, they were being performed correctly. Um, and, and when Ryukyu and, uh, when Ryukyu and um, um, officials went to Kagoshima, they also would meet with the daimyo, meet with the, the karo, the house elders, have different kinds of negotiations, receive orders, things like this. Um, and there were, if I have the, if I'm remembering correctly off the top of my head, there were somewhere around 20 Ryukyuans in Kagoshima at any given time as well. But, uh, but yeah, so again, there's no real direct uh, extensive military presence or extensive administrative structure. It's a lot of just sending orders and expecting or, you know, really, I mean, requiring, I guess, uh, expecting that, that, that the Ryukyuan court is going to observe them with, I suppose, I mean, I don't know how much it's really talked about in the, in the documents, if how much people really worried about it. 50 years after the invasion, 100 years after the invasion, but there's always the, the potential threat, you know, of invasion. But in any case, but the, the part of the part of the reason that there was such a minimal Satsuma presence in Ryukyu was because, well, most scholars say that it was because of a perceived need to to to, to hide Satsuma's influence from Beijing. Ryukyu had to, had to continue to appear to be a fully independent kingdom in order to continue to be a tributary of China, in which, and being a tributary of China meant access to the Chinese trade, um, as well as actually access to uh, information, that is to say intelligence from China. If Ryukyu, if, if Beijing said, look, you know, we're not, we're not trading with some region of Japan. We're trading with an independent kingdom, and if they're no longer independent, then we're not trading with them, right? If Beijing had said that, then Ryukyu pretty much loses all of its uh, benefit for for the Shimazu or for anybody. Mm, that's right. I, I do remember that. I, I think we had mentioned that in a previous podcast episode, and uh, also the fact that, and I think this, I, I think I heard this in one of the uh, conferences we went to, but I do remember that uh, Ryukyu was basically the only way that Japan could get Chinese medicine as well. Or, one, or at least one of the main ways. Right. I mean, the, one of the main ways. I mean, Chinese medicine came in through Nagasaki, and it also came in through through Korea. But yes, it was it was a very crucial way of gaining access to certain kinds of luxury goods, and it was also a very crucial way of gaining access to intelligence, for lack of a better word. I think that for shogunate officials, for the Shimazu, and also for the Shimazu to pass things on to the shogunate, and also for the shogunate to hear directly in whatever way from Ryukyu and from Korea what was going on in China. That was like one of the main ways that they heard what was going on in China. So that was really important for them. And, um, I, you know, it's, it's important to mention that a lot of scholars have argued, and I, I, think, it's, I think it's safe to say that it's, it was true, that Beijing did know what was going on in Ryukyu. They were not, you know, so easily deceived. There was just countless incidents where where something would slip up or something would indicate that there was some kind of samurai presence in the islands or samurai control over the islands. Um, but so Beijing knew, but then they actually ignored it in order to. Um, there's a certain word here I'm, I'm blanking on. Um, uh, anyway, but in order to, uh, they 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 intentionally ignored it in order to um, kind of maintain the, the, the correct um, appearances or whatever. D- D- Beijing knew that Satsuma controlled the Ryukyu, but by ignoring it, by not acknowledging it, they could avoid having to acknowledge it. They could avoid being forced to take those those drastic actions in terms of the tribute system. So, th- so they could keep the status quo, basically. So they could maintain the status quo and that so that they could maintain whatever it was exactly that Beijing was getting out of this relationship with such a tiny island kingdom. But they whatever it was they were getting out of it, they wanted to maintain that. And so they and so they did. There's another thing that I'm not 100 percent sure how much stock we should put in this, but there may have been from time to time some extent 
of Edo and or Beijing being afraid of the other one doing something really drastic if the status quo regarding Ryukyu was, um, was, was, was messed up in terms of, I don't know if Beijing had, any, had anything to fear from the Tokugawa invading China, because we saw that they tried that in 1590 and it, it didn't work. But in the 1590s, I'm not sure if the Tokugawa really had any real fears of the Qing invading Japan. But if, the, well, uh, but anyway, but that's, that's, that may be part of it as well. You know, let's not, let's not, uh, uh, what's the word, rock the boat. But you know, it's, it goes back to, uh, it goes back to what Luke Roberts says in his book in Performing the Great Peace. And it goes back to what a lot of other people have said about maintaining appearances and performing things correctly just because that's the way you, you do it. So even if, I, I think, I'm not, I'm not positive on this, this is not my expertise. I think that the Japanese may have actually believed that China did not know about the Shimazu control. They, they, they may have believed that their, their deceptions were successful. Ryukyu probably knew that, the, that, that these deceptions were not successful. But nevertheless, for the sake of keeping up appearances, for the sake of at least sort of pretending to do, uh, pretending to act in, 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 in the direction of doing what was expected or whatever, they went through a lot of... Every time that Chinese ambassadors, Qing ambassadors came to Ryukyu, they would hide all kind they would hide all kinds of things and they would the the Shimazu um, retainers would go to another town and you know leave town and they would hide all kinds of signs of to, of, of Japanese influence. So it sounds like uh, most likely like you said uh, the way Luke Roberts explains it with the Bakufu it's kind of a even though we know what's going on, we'll just let it go and keep up appearances to just because everyone else accepts that we're maintaining the status quo. Something, something like that. Something along those lines, and because that's just that's that's just how things were done in Tokugawa political culture. And I uh, and and I gather, I'm completely not an expert on on, on China, but. I gathered that to at least a certain extent, there was something very similar going on in Ryukyu and in China, where performing the rituals the correct way, and this is this is a Confucian thing, so it does really apply to China and Ryukyu, performing the ritual the correct way, enacting your identity, performing correctly according to your identity within a relationship, is the most important thing. So vassal should act like a vassal, and the lord should act like a lord, and the tributary should act like a tributary, and you, you behave in a certain way correctly because that's the correct way to be, perhaps more so than any uh, kind of realist, practical, strategic considerations. Yeah, that makes sense. And in the case of uh, DQ, they were behaving in the way they were supposed to be behaving towards China. So, hey, let's let the status quo stand, I guess. Yeah, and, you know, and Ryukyu... I mean, again, I, I personally, this is just my own personal leaning that, you know, I'm, I'm really kind of a big fan of this, this notion of, this notion of, of what I call ritual propriety, which is uh, rei in, in Japanese or li in Chinese. This notion of, this, this is how it was, you know, let's not talk about how it should have been or could have been if they had chosen to do something differently because they were afraid that something else might happen. This is what it was. What it was was that Ryukyu did behave in this way for 200 years, 250 years. And you can, you can say, you can try to make arguments that Ryukyu was afraid, Ryukyu felt the need to play up things in a certain way in order to really assert their affiliation with China as a defense against further Japanese encroachment. You know, look, if, if the Shimazu try to take over Ryukyu, try to exert more control over Ryukyu, Beijing might get upset and Beijing might, <laughs> might even invade Japan. You know, don't you dare mess with us, even though we're a small kingdom. Don't mess with us because messing with us means messing with Beijing. Hmm, so that makes sense. They were trying to maintain the balance. I think there's some validity to that. But I, I also, and this is again not, I'm not speaking uh, uh, 
objectively necessarily, but just my own personal leanings in terms of the way that I would prefer to interpret things um, is I'm just not, I'm not sure that, you know, Ryukyuan officials were thinking that dramatically about the political considerations for 200 years. You know, at some point you settle into a normal mode and you're no longer afraid of having to negotiate these tensions. That's a good point. I, I would imagine, you know, and it's, and it, I mean, it comes through at certain times and I don't know the precise occasions off the top of my head. There are certainly occasions when Tokugawa try to sh- try to change the policies, try to change the practices. And Ryuki says, no, 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 let's, let's keep practicing the same embassies because let's just keep doing it the right way so that nothing gets out of balance. And then certainly in the 1850s, 1860s, 1870s, especially things get, things change very dramatically. And, and all those fears and all those tensions come right back. But I would like to argue that, at least based on what I've seen, I think there's a very strong component of ritual propriety, of doing it because it's the correct way to be, because it's a demonstration of civility or civilization, and not necessarily because it's such, a, such an incredibly strategic thing to do. And uh, since you, you brought up the late 19th century, I think it's fitting to kind of finish off here. You said 1850 was the last procession. So did this have, I'm, I'm making an assumption, this probably had something to do with Perry and the Meiji Restoration, or was it really played out at that point? Was it really finishing up at that point? Yeah, so that's, I mean, we, we could probably do an entire podcast on just what happens in the 1850s, 60s, 70s. There's... Uh, an entire dissert, uh, Marco, Dr. Marco Tonello wrote an entire dissertation on exactly that and wrote, and wrote a book in Japanese, not yet in English, um, on exactly that. But um, my understanding, and what, this is one of the things I think is really interesting about sort of Bakamatsu or Meiji history in general, is that as of 1850, sure, some things for sure had already started to happen. Over the, uh, since the 1790s, there had already been some Russian incursions into the north, some encounters with the British and the French, both in Japan proper and in Ryukyu. In the 1840s, there was some increased encounters, let's say, encounters with the British and the French in Ryukyu. But for the most part, I would say that in 1850, I'm not sure that anybody really knew that things were going to change a few years down the road. So I would suggest that in 1850, probably Kagoshima and Ryukyu both thought, yeah, there will be another mission the next time there's a new shogun or or a new king, and we'll just keep doing it. But what happened, so it was not, it wasn't played out, so to speak. It was, uh, yeah, it was just continuing. But what happened was that by 1855, and I forget exactly I forget what happened. 1850 was a a normal mission. And then the next mission, I think our our listeners who are really into this period are going to kill me for not knowing these years. But at some point, 1855, I want to say maybe, the next next Ryukyu mission was on its way to Edo. It was already in Kagoshima, and they were getting ready to leave for Edo, um, when suddenly the shogun and Shimazunari Akira died. And so... You know, it it caused all kinds of. You know, we we have to take we have to put everything else on hold, do all kinds of other things, um, and like this, and then so that mission never went to Edo, and then they tried to reschedule it, so that, you know, the mission would go to Edo in 1858 or in 1860, but by that time, I don't remember the exact timeline. So I again. For all of our listeners who are really into Bakamatsu history, I apologize. But at, by the late 1850s, the Shimazu, uh, Shimazu Tokugawa tensions were, were really starting to get heated, I believe. Um, if not by, and if not by the 1850s, then certainly by the early 1860s. After, is it 1860? Um, after Iinosuke is assassinated, a lot of people thought that the Shimazu were behind it. Um, and the, so the Shimazu Lord is now afraid to go to Edo because he might get assassinated. So he makes up all kinds of excuses for not going to Edo, for not doing Sankin Kotai anymore. 
And if he's not going to Edo, then he's not bringing the Ryukyuans with him. Um, and so for that reason, combined with various other factors of, of the, the politics and, and complexity of, of the, 50s and 60, the 1850s and 60s, there are, there are additional Ryukyuan missions that are planned, but that never actually take place. And so it kind of peters out. And then in 1872, Tokyo demands that Ryukyu send a new embassy to, uh, to pay respects to the Meiji Emperor and to, you know, now that there is no longer a Tokugawa shogun, the Ryukyu kingdom should, um, uh, you know, reaffirm its loyalty. And so this 1872 mission actually is pretty interesting because from the Ryukyuan side, in a lot of respects, it's dispatched the same as the earlier ones. They wear the same costumes and they process through the streets in the same way and they do all these same ritual kind of things. They bring similar kind of gifts, I think. I'm not positive. But they kind of see it as a continuation. But by 1872, the Shimazu, there's no longer any daimyo. There's no longer any domains. The Shimazu aren't really in control of Ryukyu anymore. There's no longer a shogunate. You know, a lot of things have changed. And... This embassy arrives in Tokyo, and they are told that Tokyo is kind of, what's the word? Um, well, Tokyo has declared that the king of the country of Ryukyu, right, Ryukyu Koku-o, is now no longer the king of a kingdom, the king of a country. They've declared he's now the king of a domain. He is now Ryukyu Han-o. So he's basically been demoted to like a daimyo, essentially. He's been demoted to a daimyo, which is, comes as a, as a complete shock to the ambassadors. Go back to Ryukyu and they, you know, what the hell are we supposed to do? But he's now the only daimyo in Japan. This is now the only Han in Japan because all the other Han have already been abolished. So it's very strange. <laughs> and then for the next seven years, and this, I mean, this gets really complicated. And I think we discussed it in a previous um, podcast. For the next seven years, you have this Ryukyu Han-o, the daimyo of Ryukyu, who is kind of, uh, I mean, kind of the same as he always has been, kind of independent, but kind of increasingly not so much. And then 1879, Tokyo says, you're you're done. (laughs) We're, We're annexing your territory. We're calling it Okinawa Prefecture. We're appointing you a governor. The king has to come to Tokyo, and and he'll be from now on. He'll be a marquis. He'll be a koshaku. And so, um, yeah. So now we're getting into a whole other separate thing. But but I, I think the eighteen seventy two mission is interesting because um, I certainly don't count it as one of the missions to Edo because number one, there was no longer an Edo. Uh, you know, it takes place upon, uh, uh, within a very different political context. But as Tonello argues, as Tonello points out, the costumes, the music, you know, the, the, the ritual forms, the ritual practices were actually very much the same as in 1850. You know, so to, to a certain extent, and I think this is, it's, it's important because it shows that even though things had changed very dramatically in Tokyo, things had not changed dramatically at all in Ryukyu just yet. And so the, the notion that 1868 is some kind of immediate turning point is, is not, uh, you know, another conversation, but the notion of 1868 as an as a immediate turning point when everything changed is not really the case, yeah? Yeah. We, we always kind of, hindsight being 2020, always, we always kind of see things that way. But when you're on the ground, that's never how it works out. Yeah. And yeah, exactly. And, and you know, and we need to, we need to simplify for the sake of historical narratives to try to give some kind of summary, give some kind of overview. But, um, uh, you know, in, in, in just numerous ways, and especially for Ryukyu, things did not change immediately in 1868. A lot of this stuff, particularly the, the Meiji side of Ryukyu relations, um, has been discussed in the last two or three podcasts from um, the Meiji at 150 podcast, which I, I don't know if you've been listening to this, Chris. Uh, I think I've downloaded it. I haven't gotten to it yet, but it is in my, it's in my queue. Yeah. So, but, uh, uh, Professor Tristan Gruno at, uh, University of British Columbia at UBC for the last, I don't know how many months 
has been interviewing a lot of the top scholars in, 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 in Edo, Meiji history um, about all different aspects of the Meiji period, the Meiji Restoration. Um, so Meiji at 150 podcast, you can Google it, check it out. Okay, that's it for another episode of the Samurai Archives podcast. See you again in about a month. In the meantime, be sure to check out patreon.com slash samurai archives for updates, bonus content, and ways you can help support the podcast. Also, a positive review on iTunes also helps us out, so if you're so inclined, please feel free to do that, or give us a positive review on whatever platform you use to listen to the podcast. So that's all for now, and we will see you next time.